Dr. Dr. Maipal sir, Dr. Namrata, and uh, thank you so much for inviting me for sharing this, uh, you know, passion of mine. Uh, I'll quickly share my screen. So. Okay, so I'll be speaking on uh, biometric considerations in achieving uh, refractive predictability in premium IOLs, and uh, I have no financial interest. And as we are all aware that uh, patients' expectations have grown, and uh, we have now uh, the era of the refractive cataract surgery, as we have seen over the last two lectures as well. And excellent outcomes with laser refractive surgery have raised the bar for cataract surgeons as well. And uh, hard selling of freedom from glasses or throw away from throw away or spectacles by our refractive fraternity may be uh, another reason. So, in fact, and it's not unfounded. Everybody would love to be free of glasses if they can, and if if they can get a quality outcome. So, there is no question left on that as well. And success with premium eyes it largely depends upon near perfect refractive outcomes. And uh, residual refractive error is the primary cause for a dissatisfied premium eye patient. So, I think before we start looking at lots of other things. it would be important that uh, we ensure that we have a great refractive result and that's what my talk is all about so precise and predictable preoperative measurements and accurate biometry are the key to achieving near emetropia and a satisfied patient of course there is much more to it than just biometry but i think this is the key to success as well measurements for premium eyes can be dependent on multiple factors so precise preoperative measurements a role of advanced technologies to help the clinician do better and beyond biometry and understanding the importance understanding this uh, of the importance lays the foundation of a successful premium mal practice so i think a premium mal practice requires working on and it does not come automatically and you have to really uh, work at it because a high powered lens that is only 0.1 mm forward in the capsular pack can cause almost a one diopter refractive error so the scope for error is very small and a satisfied patient will bring you satisfied other uh, potential patients as well So when it comes to diagnostic instruments, uh, when you're dealing with a patient for biometry, you could be looking at many things today, uh, right from uh, a corneal topographer to optical or immersion biometry, manual keratometries to an OCT uh, to look at the fovea. If you're looking for a premium eye patient, uh, you could be doing tomography in certain cases, and today actually a tear film assessment also becomes really important. So. Uh, the considerations for premium eye patients are many uh, k readings from multiple instruments i'll talk about it just now check if there are inconsistencies due to due to the poor ocular surface as i just mentioned before a good patient history and the profession of the patient is very very important so when we do a biometry and when we first meet the patient i always spend one minute talking to the patient about what he does and what he is looking for what kind of glasses he use what are his hobbies i think that is very important uh, in addition to biometry for you to decide what kind of i will to choose what kind of post refractive outcome to choose as well uh we would love to exclude patients with unrealistic expectations but i think the number of patients that you exclude has gone down drastically with improvements in technology and our understanding and uh, of course the patient should understand the potential possibilities of side effects it's always good to mention about possibility of occasional glare and halos which i always do uh, to the patient also good to tell them that this we are not going to be 100% sure that you're going to be completely free of glasses i always mention to them that you will be mostly free of glasses you may have to use you use some glasses for occasional things like fine print reading or uh, when driving so that that builds up the right expectations for the patient today it's very important to also ask for previous history of any refractive surgery you you'll be surprised there are so many patients who actually have undergone refractive surgery and you could miss some of them with a small uh, you know correction which was done and you could uh, be sitting with a refractive surprise so biometry has come a long way from the time we used to use the javel shears or the bosch and lomb uh, keratometers and the ultrasounds which evolved a lot but then we came to the optical biometries which came in almost 10 15 years back and today we've come to a stage where optical biometries have become tremendously better than what we were even 5 years back so prerequisites for a good biometry a good keratometry which includes both the magnitude of astigmatism and the axis because today we do a lot of torics the axial lens the ac depth the lens thickness and the effective lens position now the good thing is all these can be done by an optical biometer very nicely and in one shot and as dr ramamurthy said while it is not essential to have an optical biometer but it's highly recommended definitely to have one but let that not stop you from going on to try focal lenses so we we've come a long way from what we did with keratometry is coming to the ocular surface i think uh, a good look at the slit lamp is very important and some some centers actually do a default uh, 
uh, you know, tear film analysis and uh, ocular surface analysis, but that's not absolutely necessary. But a good clinical exam is definitely important to make sure that you get a perfect uh, uh, biometry as well. And then also, it's always great to do the biometry as uh, on a virgin eye without installation of any drops, without using the non-contact tonometer. Otherwise, you can have problems. So with the old biometer, as you can see, we used to have measurements done and we would be very good with power difference or the magnitude of astigmatism, but these keratometers are not great when picking the steep meridian. If you're planning to do toric IOLs, you would have to be very, very meticulous if you're using a manual keratometer, but definitely for biometry, uh, for getting the IL power right, you, would, you still use these case definitely. For getting the access right, I think there's nothing better than a placido-based uh, topography. It's not essential again, and uh, much of the new bio optical biometers do a great job of getting the access right as well. But when in doubt, it's always great to go back to a topographer and do a placido topography. Keratometry could have many errors um, if you're not uh, using a focused eyepiece, failure to calibrate, poor patient fixation, a dry eye or a poor ocular surface, and so many other things, an irregular cornea. Optical biometry, I think I think the key uh, that for us, our premium eye practice, you know, it went up uh, about 10 years back when we shifted to optical biometry. And whenever one can afford one, there is one should not think twice before switching. You know, it, I, I do keep hearing lectures that, you know, uh, if you're doing great immersion, you don't need to go for optical. Now, if you can afford it, if, if your pay, patients are ready to pay for it, there should be nothing to stop you from going for it as well. But Doing an immersion is not something which you're going to doing wrong. If you can't afford to get one for your practice, one should not mind. We've come a long way from the Almaster 500, which was set the benchmark initially, and then we started using the Lensstar with more markers for the keratometry. And today, the Almaster 700 sets, again, the gold standards. It has three-zone keratometry, telecentric keratometries, has the new option, which will come up soon, of the Placido as well. Or similar to Placido, they will be giving us uh, some kind of derived Placido things. And then, of course, the total K. And that helps. So telecentric keratometry essentially means that when you move the machine backwards and forwards to focus, you can have the dots, you know, moving away or far. So with the Almaster 700, that takes care of that, which I don't think um, any of the others uh, biometry biometers do. I don't know how much difference it will make, whether it will make a drastic difference, but this is what uh, the company would make us believe at least. And I'm sure it has some scientific basis to it. Then the total keratometry, which again has, uh, you know, a lot of uh, new advantages and proposed advantages as well, because uh, the, it measures the posterior corneal surface and that helps derive the total keratometry. And uh, while most other devices would only choose the anterior cornea, uh, which, uh, you know, which would not, and they use nomograms uh, with all the formulas like the Barrett's uh, Universal 2 and the Barrett's Toric calculator, where uh, they use uh, nomograms to assess uh, to incorporate the posterior corneal astigmatism so total k is derived like this i will not go into the details but it helps in uh, you know giving you values which can be replaced in most of the formulas except the barrett's because barrett's already has a nomogram inbuilt into it so you could use it with all these formulas here and uh, the Hoffer Q and all these, you can replace the total K into these as well. And it's compatible. Whereas uh, if you're using the Barrett suite, then of course, uh, you know, you would have the separate Barrett's total K universal and the Barrett's total K toric formulas for that. Now, when you're doing toric IOLs, and especially if you're doing trifocals, I think the, the threshold for switching to toric is very small for me. If I have even small astigmatisms, I will always do a calculation for my trifocals and see if they need a toric because the outcomes will not be great if you're leaving uncorrected astigmatism or sometimes I will even do a femto LRI if there's very small astigmatism. So for preoperative pre pre corneal astigmatism in toric IOS, the step one is to determine the orientation of the steep and the flat meridians and uh, measure the power difference between these two meridians. So we should avoid the mindset that in toric IL, what's needed is simply to get a set of Ks. And one has to actually put in a lot of thought into doing the keratometries and a lot of effort. So what should you do? I typically recommend that you, you usually would have two or three devices in your clinic which can do the keratometries, even if they are like an auto keratometer besides your optical biometer. So get readings from two or three different devices and make sure that you have consistency between these measurements for the axis as well as the magnitude. And if you're not getting consistency, then try to look for the reason why you don't have a consistency. If it's a poor ocular surface or if there is something else, you can call the patient back once after improving the surface. And then that would still help in getting a good... Uh, you know, biometry. So don't don't rest till you have found out why a reading is not consistent. It could be a small pterygium. It could be a small corneal scar. So once you've done that, then you look for the triangle of agreement. I think this is very important. And I've taken this slide from Warren Hill. Uh, he typically recommends that for both the axis and the magnitude, you should have a primary device. So like for the axis of the steep meridian, 
you can have a primary instrument which could be a placido if you have one otherwise it could be just your optical case and then you can go on to have a secondary device and a tertiary device which when you look for consistency if all of them are showing you the same readings for example here three devices have been used the primary device for us is obviously the placido but you can also use the isle master which is very very accurate and then you can use something from the pentacam and if all three are showing similar axes for example here it's the 83 here 84 here then you you know you're relaxed because you know that the, my axis is right if you were using only one device and you got it wrong you would go wrong completely and have a poor result so it's always great to have two or three devices in your clinic which can help you come with this similarly for the magnitude of astigmatism you can have a primary device like the isle master keratometry and for support you could have something like an eye trace or it could be so many other devices which you could use you could have the atlas you could have a topographer it could be your auto keratometer for that matter but if they all look good i use the virion as well so that would sometimes you know it helps and so that gives you peace of mind that you have it right and then you can go ahead with your toric calculations Axial lens, of course, we've come a long way from the ultrasonic biometry, the contact methods. I used to use that uh, in the early 2000s and then uh, shifted on to immersion for a few years and then came to optical. Now, speaking about optical is a totally different topic, but what it does is it sets you free of, you know, it's, it's more objective and your operators can use it, even, even the uh, immersion ones. But applination, I think, is a total no-no today. If anybody is still doing applination ultrasonic biometry, I think it's not acceptable and immersion is easily available on all devices and works beautifully well and can be trained to your technicians as well and is almost as good as optical biometry. So for the axial length, there is no reason why we should still stick to a contact method. And yes, optical biometry is the gold standard and you can see here why. For applanation, the scope of error is plus minus 0.24 millimeters. For immersion, it's plus minus 0.12 in the axial length and uh, an aisle master or lens star will only give you 0 0.01. So obviously axial length measurements are the key to biometry and when you go wrong with those, you can get a refractive surprise. So the new uh, biometers which have come about uh, the aisle master 700 and a couple of others also as well, which have a swept source OCT scan can do a great job because they can penetrate my very dense cataracts and almost 99% of cataracts today can be penetrated. And they also have a fixation check which you can see here and that is basically for uh, you know the fovea and it tells you whether you got the readings right and if you didn't get it right you could you know you have a good uh, scan there uh, also uh, you know you can have uh, standard deviations on your measurements so it's more accurate and more repeatable measurements and you can cross check it. it it takes multiple scans and you can have differences in the scan stand out and you can go repeat them so it always is important to look at these scans it's not great to always just look at the printout if you can sit for the for two minutes on the machine and look at the scan Scans, it usually helps a lot. Otherwise, at least look at these standard deviations over here. So these standard deviations will tell you if certain measurements are off significantly, and then you can have them repeated. Similarly, uh, you know, here differences in axial length would be really small. Differences in Ks will be usually really small. Otherwise, you could go back and repeat these as well. The last frontier in biometry, at least, is the effective lens position. And uh, almost all the new formulas, they typically do use this. And this was actually something which uh, has brought the biometry to the next level, where almost plus minus 0.5 outcomes are seen in 90% of our surgery patients. Something which I also like to do as well, I'll to spend two, uh, two, two minutes on this, is the abrometry. This may not be available to everyone, and it is not necessary to do this, but if you have access to it, it helps when planning premium IOs and trifocal IOs. It's great to see that the you know, corneal aberrations are not significant, and it's only the lens aberrations which are there. So if you have this, you can always have a look at that, and then this becomes a good case for doing a premium IOL. And of course, if you have high corneal aberrations, as in this patient, you can see over there that there are significant uh, corneal aberrations over here and the trifoil and the coma. So then obviously this patient may not be a great uh, patient for that. And then of course, you can always look at the angle alpha and the kappa for premium IOs, the angle alpha, it is suggested should be less than 0.5, but there is still no sh uh, definite uh, thing on this. And many surgeons don't actually pay much attention to this. So angle alpha and kappa can be thought about. And then of course the toric planning and then it's good to have a quick look if you have a placido in your clinic uh, then there's no reason why you should not do it for a premium mild patient sometimes you'll have a pre inferior steepening you may have a form of keratoconus or an irregular cornea and then you may be hit with a surprise and a dissatisfied premium mild patient now coming to very shortly to the formulas they've come a long way as well the first generation the second generation and the third generation and today we are sitting on the fourth and the fifth generation formulas today i think universally uh, most people do tend to rely more on the barrett's uh, universal 2 or the barrett suite 
and the hill rbf formula which has uh, artificial intelligence and a couple of new formulas like the cane and the super ladders which are still coming up but this uh, typically tells you how to choose between the formulas and you'll see here that at the bottom these formulas the new formulas that we use today have a huge range for the long eyes for the average eyes and for the short eyes so these are the two formulas which i tend to use as well the barrett's and the hill rbf and they've given us great results hill rbf uh, is artificial intelligence based it's not a formula and it does not depend on the elp and it also tells you when an eye is out of bounds which means if it has unusual measurements uh, very long axial length with very short uh, ac depth or or similar it will typically tell you that you know not to use these calculations and be on your guard and it has uh, now dramatically increased the range of our long and short eyes and with much more eyes included and it's possible to aim for residual refractive errors the barrett suite is where you know it's integrated in almost all the new uh, 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 optical biometers especially so with the almaster 700 and which shows superior results to almost all the other formulas and it does include uh, posterior surface of the cornea is uh, also included in the barrett suite uh, with the nomogram and uh, it includes three formulas the universal 2 for non toric iols the toric calculator and the true k and uh, you can use the barrett suite on the most of these devices but as dr ramamurthy said if you don't have an optical biometer it's still available on the ascrs and apscrs sites so the barrett's to uses typically requires the axial length and the keratometry and the lens factor optional things are the ac depth and the white to white and the lens thickness and the design factor now obviously these four things on the right they increase the accuracy of these formulas so lens factor is derived from the srkt constant the design factor is uh, is a uh, it influences the il calculation specifically and it is il specific and uh, without the df calculation is possible for ils but it is less precise without the white to white ac depth and the lens thickness the calculation obviously will not be as precise as you can get so to increase accuracy if you are using all these things into the formula it obviously will give you better results so uh, i will not go into the details of how it does this but it has the option of utilizing all these five variables which you can see at the bottom and as i've just discussed so I, I think it it goes a long way in giving giving you excellent uh, results, so, and the performance has been proven to be great. And when it compares to the other formulas, I'll just show you how it has been shown to be much much more accurate when used with optical biometers, and specifically so with the Al Master Seven Hundred. The Toric calculator for uh, by Barrett has done a great job. We've done away with most of the other company based formulas, uh, the calculators which we were using before. It incorporates for all the formulas. and has inbuilt nomogram for posterior corneal elastigmatism so you don't need to make any of the adjustments and uh, you don't need to use the baylor's nomogram and it does a great job and i have shifted to this almost for the last 5 years i don't use anything else so please ensure that uh, you are using one of these formulas or a company based formulas which also incorporate the barrett's uh, uh, you know toric calculator as well post laser vision correction i think again there's a huge leap now uh, today the barrett's true k is what i trust a lot and it is based on the barrett's universal 2 but it takes uh, into measurement it gives you the options of uh, choosing for post lasik hyperopic lasik and prk and uh, it again has given great results but i also use the ascaris calculator for all my patients here you can feed in data from uh, various devices including the pentacam and the oct whatever you have you don't have to feed in all of them but whatever you have you can feed those and it will give you the different formulas five or six this is again free of cost available on the srs site and you can see here that i would choose the highest formula power which was being picked up by most of these uh, formulas and it really helps in using this and uh, some of these post attractive surgery patients i do use the ekr report on the pentacam as well so i think trying to finish off uh, the tk formulas which are there on the almaster 700 have made life more easy because they can also pick up uh, they can be useful in uh, eyes corneas which have been dealt with before which are not virgin corneas and that's where they play a big role because they measure actually measure the posterior corneal surface and the new formulas by barrett which are for tk can be used i'm not sure i'm i'm not using this so i'll leave it for discussion whether these are going to be there finally we should always do an outcomes analysis otherwise we will not know what we are doing so it's very important these refractive form must look at your refractive outcomes otherwise you will not know what you're doing and you'll keep using the formulas but you will not get anywhere so as you can see here these formulas are all good the ray tracing the barrett universal and hill they all give about 90% accuracy for plus minus 0.5 and again another comparison of uh, the same outcomes and for us we also do post op evaluations for our patients for toric placements we this is a very good device on the eye trace again no financial interest but i love using this it tells you whether your toric is sitting in place and whether you need to rotate it and it's great to check all your patients post op for the access of implantation as well 
and if you have a dissatisfied trifocal patient or a multifocal patient you can look for other reasons for dissatisfaction whether there is a decentered lens or uh, another reason for that so to summarize i think uh, trifocal iols and similar lenses have come a long way and i think i use a fair number i've got good numbers with these eyes atlisa trifocal and the toric have been very happy patients have been very satisfied so uh, accurate biometry is of course the main step besides all the other things that i spoke about and other diagnostic devices also help in improving your overall management and results attention to details and talking to the patient and understanding the patient needs is very very important for a satisfactory outcome and i think outcomes analysis is also very important to keep improving yourself and with that i'll stop sharing